must have been 1999. I had just boarded a plane for a flight from Pittsburgh to Dallas. I had been at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary teaching a class in conjunction with several other denominations on the subject of grace, and I was flying home. I was tired. I, I wanted to get home so badly, and even back before 9-11, they used to really pack us into those planes. It was rare that you ever had a seat next to you that was empty. I was seated in the aisle seat, and there was a man in the window seat, but between us there was a seat free as the plane started to fill up with passengers. It remained empty. I saw first class fill up. I saw the seats around me fill up. I turned and I looked. It looked like most of the other seats were full. And it looked like just about all the passengers had finally boarded the plane. And we had lucked out. And I high-fived the guy sitting in the window seat. We were going to at least have a comfortable flight. I prayed, God, please let the seat stay empty. And just before the flight crew was going to close the forward door, I heard the attendant announce, hold for a final passenger. And my heart sang. <laughs> Please let it be one of the other seats, I pray. Please, God, let it be one of the other seats. And then in disappointment, I realized that the center seat would have someone in it. And I waited and I watched to see who it would be. And that's when I saw this man coming around the corner and down the aisle towards me. Yes, it was Mr. Rogers. And suddenly my prayer became, oh God, please let him be sitting next to me. And sure enough, Mr. Rogers came down the aisle, past the full first class and right up to my row. I looked up at him. And he looked down and said, I think that's my seed. And I jumped up and said, oh yes, please, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> and yes, for two and a half hours, I got to sit next to my childhood hero, Mr. Fred Rogers. Now, I was going to be nice. I promise I was going to be nice. I wasn't going to talk his head off for two and a half hours. Yes, Kate, I was not going to talk his head off for two and a half hours. He finds that hard to believe, but I was going to be nice. But he wouldn't have it. As we began to taxi for takeoff, he struck up a conversation with me, and we ended up talking the whole flight to Dallas about life and about ministry, its challenges, its joys, its pains, its celebrations. Growing up, Fred Rogers and his Mr. Rogers neighborhood, along with Sesame Street and the Electric Company, some of you remember those things, all taught me about the importance of love and accepting others. Even others who might not be like me, and in fact, especially others who were not like me. I remember when I first learned that Fred Rogers had been a Presbyterian minister. It was not a surprise. The kindness that was very much a part of who and what he was was what I had come to know as the beginning personality and character of a pastor. Indeed, as I had told him on that flight, he was part of the reason why I became a pastor. His care and his concern for others, and especially for the least of us all, for children, touched me deeply, taught me that I was loved. It was from Mr. Rogers while growing up that I learned about loving my neighbor as myself. His life expressed it. His life exemplified it. His care for children, for the least of these, demonstrated the importance of loving one's neighbor as oneself. I remember we even touched on these two greatest commandments 
of Jesus while we were on that flight. When Jesus was asked which was the greatest or first or primary commandment, Jesus responded not by quoting one of the big ten, like one might expect. No, he quotes from the very core of the Hebrew faith. From the gospel within the gospel. He quotes the Shema, found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Note the direction to recite them to your children. Even here, the importance of children is central. And Mr. Rogers noted that to me on that flight. The Shema is the heart and soul of the Hebrew faith. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. They recite it. They even sing it. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. It makes sense that Jesus would go to the very heart and soul of the Hebrew faith to find the first, the primary, the most important commandment. But he doesn't stop there. The Pharisee didn't ask him which was the second commandment, only which was the first, but, but Jesus went on. He added it, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Almost as if to point out that one can't really love God without also loving others, Jesus linked the two together. And the, the second commandment comes from someplace else in the Hebrew Scriptures. It comes from Leviticus. Chapter 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Sadly, Christians will often jump to the first and primary commandment and forget the second, which flows from the first, embodies the first, is enabled by the first, and is an expression of the first commandment. We love the Lord our God by loving our neighbor as ourself. That, that's how Jesus did it. By loving others, he expressed supreme, eternal, divine love for God. That's what Mr. Rogers told me. The importance of loving God is crucial, but the importance of loving neighbor as self is just as crucial. Now, some will try to wiggle out by trying to define one's neighbor too narrowly. Or by asking, who is my neighbor? Over in Luke's Gospel, that question is actually put to Jesus. I learned on Sesame Street from a song there that my neighbor, my neighbors are the people you meet each day. Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood? In your neighborhood? Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet each day. Mr. Rogers made that even more direct, more proactive by singing, 
so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine, could you be mine, won't you be my neighbor? Mr. Rogers invited others, children, adults, everyone, to be his neighbor. And I believe that is part of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, to be open and proactive about identifying everyone as your neighbor. Not trying to find loopholes to wiggle out of it, but to accept that everyone is your neighbor. Even people you don't like. Even people that don't look like you or act like you or talk like you or smell like you or probably even taste like you. Everyone is our neighbor. That's what Jesus said and did. That's how Jesus lived his life. Right here in this teaching, that's what Jesus proclaimed. That's what he did in his life and ministry. And that's what he calls all of us to do. It's what Mr. Rogers did throughout his long ministry on TV with children. That's what he did with me. Indeed, it was on that flight, in the midst of our long conversations on that flight, that I first came out to someone, not with fear, not with self-loathing, but with hope, sharing with him that I was gay. And his love and his acceptance and his compassion towards me, right there from his center seat, was truly affirming. I'll never forget how I was sad that the flight to Dallas was coming to an end. I've never been sad at the end of a flight, <laughs> but I was that day. As we walked up the jet bridge, we had a few final words. While other people were wanting to meet with him and talk with him, he asked me for my contact information. I gave him my card, and he said he would write. He did, a couple of times before he passed, nearly 10 years later. And then he added, thank you for being my neighbor on this flight. And with tears in my eyes, we hugged. Loving God and loving neighbor, we cannot do one without the other. By doing one, we are doing the other. In a world that is torn asunder by hatred and bitterness, in a world that is exploding around us with war and murder, with division and disaffiliation, we are called to love. Love God and love neighbor. That is our challenge. That is our calling. That is our privilege. That is our joy. That is the gospel within the gospel. The heart and soul. The core of our faith. There are lots of theological intricacies and ideas, lots of mysteries and spiritual truths, lots of profound teachings, but in the very heart and soul, in the very gospels within the gospel that we proclaim, in this affirmation, we proclaim one thought, one idea, one affirmation that is so simple that children get it implicitly. We are called to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. And on these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. He doesn't limit that statement, by the way. He doesn't say some of the law and the prophets. He doesn't say this little bit of the law over here and this little bit of the prophets over here, but not this stuff out here. You've got to do that too. No, he says all the law and the prophets. That last line nails it down. We try to create rules and regulations, 
We try to fashion statements and faith and creeds in the church, and those are fine and good. The gospel within the gospel. And that's why it's often called that. The gospel within the gospel is loving God and loving neighbor. Because right here on these two commandments hangs everything else. The Big Ten, all the other rules, all the teachings of the prophets, everything comes down to loving God and loving neighbor as self. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let me and of God's people.